Welcome to Rams Brawl Draft Week. That's right. I'm here with Arlen Harris and Tommy Polly. This is Derek C. Paul, and we are here to go all out on the 2020 draft, the Los Angeles Rams. Let's start with Arlen. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Since last time, coming off of spring break, so right back into school and uh, ready to get ready for this, uh, this, this draft these next couple of days. And have things changed with the, the president and his committee coming out with this whole plan for May 1st, phase one, phase two, are things changing in Missouri at all? Not on the education front. I know we uh, meet every Friday as a staff, as a faculty, and you know we're still not going to go back into the school. Our finals are going to be, um, you know, progress as planned since we're uh, a private school, so we're not going to follow the the public ruling. So for us, nothing really changes. I'm just hoping they release us so that first week of June we can get ready to practice some football and get around our, our squad. Fair enough, Tommy. How are you doing? Nothing, just getting ready for the draft, just watching it real closely. And that's it, and just getting ready to uh, talk about the Rams and, and and get ready for the show. That's about it. So getting ready for this draft, I'm just curious, just kind of like for your opening statement here. When we first got together for this podcast, and like all you made it clear that since you are coaching up running backs and getting them ready for college, you follow more of the college game now. But that has its advantages. Come in draft time, you know exactly what these guys are doing, what they've been through, what they're looking for. How have you prepared to see how the NFL pans out this week for the draft or in the Rams? How have you prepared for it? You know, preparation as far as, you know, seeing where these guys are ending up. Yeah, like or, as you're scouting things out, thinking about who's a good fit for the Rams and who's a good fit for the other NFL teams and so on and so forth. It's, it's um you know, you have your own expectations. And then, um you know, watching, you know, some of the other experts or guys that's been close to the game, both coaching or the analysts and seeing some of their feedback. And, you know, through the all-season process, the way, you know, guys can leapfrog each other and seeing the fits and all that stuff, it, it's keeping me close to the game. You know, it's allowing me to do uh, watch a little bit more film of these guys and, you know, seeing the emphasis on, like you said, the backs, where they fit right now. They're looking at, is there going to be even a back taken in the first round and why that is? And then also the difference in backs. I always say, I don't, I don't like to throw all the backs. I feel like there's an all-purpose back. I feel like there's different backs. And depending on what conference they come out of, you can kind of gauge what um, their production might be their first couple of years and what they're familiar with and comfortable with. So I think the deep, their running backs is deep. I think it's not really a drop-off after maybe – six or seven so um it's it's going to be interesting and exciting to see where these guys end up tommy you are coaching too you've been close to game for a long time it's, it's one of those things where now you're getting back into the analyst side how have you prepared to cover this draft for the rams i'm, I'm closer to looking at the rams more where probably years past i'd have been looking at you know the general of the draft maybe guys i know who i work with so now I'm just looking at basically what the Rams need is, is having me dig deeper in what the Rams roster look like instead of just watching as a fan from afar and, and things like that. It's make, it making me analyze uh, the Rams a little bit more and what they need, what they don't need, things like that. And like all the side, it's been um, looking at some of the linebackers that's in the draft, some of the edge rushers, um, just some of the players in the draft more deeply. I probably wouldn't have did that in years past. I would have probably just uh, remember them from games – games I've seen and things like that or watch a clip here there but I've been really looking at film and also been looking at film with the uh, Rams offense looking at some of the running backs Henderson and see what he do and, and looking at Brown and see what they might bring to the table so I've been doing a lot of info seeking so all that in mind this is the weekend and because the Rams have not had a first round pick since I think the dawn of time they really have to dig deep now and make sure these picks count and for the most part they have 22 of their last 27 picks are still on the roster. What are their three keys this week? If you were going to go, Tommy, right away and think three keys for the Rams in this draft, what are they? You got to get another offensive lineman. You got uh, Havenstein. I think he's coming up on his contract. And then you got um, you got the left tackle. Uh, he's he's a little long in the tooth. Uh, Whits, Whitsworth, I mean, I know you just signed to a three-year deal, but he, he probably doesn't play that out. So uh, last year in the draft, they, they drafted no boom. and they got blighted in the draft, uh, so I think they're going to go outside this year. And, and they also need a uh, long receiver, somebody that can stretch the field, get deep, a long, longer guy, can catch the jump ball, 
things of that nature. So I think of those two, if, if I'm maybe a back in the third round, if it's one there, I, I'll go that. But out of all the scenarios, uh, I think Marlon was talking a little earlier. What I would, what I would try to do, I'll probably try to trade the pick. Um, probably that third round pick. I see four net is on the table. Uh, if they're looking to shop for net, I grab for net and that. In a third round pick, maybe somebody else, uh, and, and go in that direction instead of getting a uh, guy out of the draft. Okay, just a couple clarifying questions for you. I mean, when talking about the offensive line, you're talking about in 2018 they went and got No Boom and Allen. In 2019 mm-hmm. they got Edwards and Black. Jones. Jones. Black Black was Black was there. So that's that's the setup depth wise. Whitworth at. I mean, you're not. This is kind of crazy, but you're only a couple years older than Whitworth. This guy is long in the tooth, man. I am. Right, he's long in the tooth. So I mean, got to say he's going to be two years on, on that deal. And so you can teach a new guy coming in. You don't know how to play. Are you looking early, like second round for the offensive line, or are you looking later on? Well, I'm, looking at, I'm looking at first pick. That's your first pick, uh, second, the 52nd pick. Mm-hmm. I keep that, and I get offensive line. Offensive lineman. I was looking at um, Josh Josh Jones. Uh, he might be gone off the board. And if not, I'll go ahead and take Austin Jackson out of USC. He's a big kid. He's like 21 years old, a little less than that. Got good feet and young, somebody they can develop, hometown guy who they can promote. That's what, so that's what I get. Okay, so three keys. Offensive line. Get your go trade for Fournette. Now, I have questions on that one. We'll get to that. Okay. And what's your what's your third key there? And getting a receiver, a tall, you know, a long, stretchy, rangy receiver that can catch the deep ball, catch the red uh, red zone pass. Gotcha. Okay, Arlen, your three keys. What are the three things you think the Rams can do in this draft? Uh, my three keys are make sure that you replace your offensive threats. We're losing Gurley and um, Cooks. You're going to need to do that right away. I know we talk about protecting your money. With uh, golf, but at the same time, you got to give him some viable threats because that that creates a lot of holes in the um, offense. And then um, also think that you need to uh, sh- protect the middle of the field on defense and getting a linebacker or somebody that can pop out and, and protect from hash to hash because you have a good defensive front. But I think um, you know, looking at some of the mock drafts, they actually have a lot of people have them taking Jordan Brooks, you know, a linebacker with the first pick. And, um, you know, with some of the things during the offseason, I know they let go um, a couple of guys and their lead tackler is gone. So, again, I think the, the, the main thing is, you know, getting replacing your offensive threats, protect your quarterback, and then getting somebody that's going to protect the middle of the field on defense. When having conversations with former players, so you, Arlen, and Tommy, Compare it to, say, the experts. There does seem to be a difference. You guys see a need for wide receiver where others aren't seeing that need. We, you talked about running back, and that's one that, that needs to be addressed somewhere, but not necessarily where you guys have been talking about it. What do you see as former players that the average Joe doesn't see? Um, well, some of the, the picks, like I like Brooks. I like Jordan Brooks. Um, he's a solid player, but he's a blitzing guy. He can't read the box real too good. Um, so his diagnosing and, and him having to get everybody lined up and check and do it, I don't know. That might be a little limited. So that second round might be a little bit too early for him. Um, but what, like I said, what I'm saying, um, but on the Rams part, you you can say they don't need a receiver. Why? Because they got two thousand yard receivers. But to me. They don't have nobody. Uh, they don't scan anybody. I think their coach do a great job of scheming them to get open, and they catch a lot of balls. But I don't think it they exert fear in any defense. So that's what I'm saying. So and another thing, like you said, Havenstein is old. You're gonna have to replace him soon. And then I think the, uh, your right tackle is coming up. Well, Whitsworth old, and Havenstein is coming up for. Well, uh, Havenstein uh, actually has time. Havenstein has time, has time okay. but Blythe is back on a one year. Mm-hmm. And then everything else is kind of mixes with young guys. So Bly is the one that you kind of need to see if this is his year or not. Well, well, a lot of times in the second round, you, you always take the highest rated player. And I think for them, the highest rated player would yeah. be offensive lineman. What if that highest rated player at that point in time isn't 
a lineman right now? What if there's a run of offensive linemen before the Rams get there? Where do you go? I like the Hennessy kid. If he's sticking around, if he's sitting around there on the Matt Hennessy, I know he, you know, he's a center. You know, he can come out and bump, bump, bump some guys out. I don't, I think you keep him at center um, or guard, but like we talked about before, I think you need an interior guy. If he's sitting on there in a legitimate offense alignment and, you know, I know there's, there's going to be a lot of receivers, but if they're slim pickings at the offensive line, you got a quality guy sitting there right there. I think you, I think you got to shoot your shot because five picks later, you get another one. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I, th- I think you go after the old lineman and then you, you there's enough depth that receiver that we can pick a, a rangy guy that might be sitting around a, a couple picks later. Because the thing that I like too, when I start looking at the draft order, you got the Seahawks. I know we got 52, 57. And the Seahawks got 59. So you know they're going to be looking at the direction that we're going. So I think you got to, you know, be real careful and, and then um, go out there and shoot your shot early if, if there's going to be no trades down the road like, like we was talking about. Tommy, what about you? Where are you looking in terms of if that guy you want isn't there, that, say, offensive lineman, say that there's a run and they're gone, where are you going next? Man, that's, that's tough. So, I mean, I think it's enough linemen, offensive linemen that's going to be there. But if it's not, I'll probably go edge. I'll go edge, uh, maybe Terrell Lewis. I'm a, maybe an edge guy, somebody that can come off the, the edge a little bit, a younger guy. You know, uh, Lloyd's on a one-year deal. Um, so looking for somebody that can possibly replace him or they can battle and see who uh, earns the uh, the money. But, I mean, I, it just seemed like to me that defense is – I know you say in the middle of the field, but you got Mike Kaza right here. Wahoo, you don't like him? Nah, he cool, but I'm just saying that that death went. The thing about when you got somebody like Donald that's going to command those double teams, like you said, if it's that downhill run game, who is that guy that's going to strike fear and make those running backs bounce? And then, you know what I mean? Like, that's 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 kind of where I'm, I'm at with it. And I say he's not a solid guy, but clearly, if there's an edge, I think being able to control that middle of the field is more important. And create those turnovers and and making those guys get those guys in those those long distance situations and third down. With me, per I, I I think if you bring in a what well, middle linebacker is a tough position in the, in, in the NFL. You got to get the guys lined up. You got to know the checks. You got to know the uh, get the calls in from the sideline from the coach. Know the hand signals and all that. I think it's too much to ask for a younger guy to come in in the second third round and. And do and do better than Mike Kaiser. I just don't see that Mike Kaiser been in the league two years, so he's going he's going to be more comfortable getting them calls. So going on going along with their history, the history says they taking a guy, you know, a linebacker in the fourth or fifth round. So in that case, I, I think you get those guys a shot. They they're young. Him and him and Young. They they're young. Well, his name is Young, but his name is Kenny Young. Um, and then Mike Kaiser, I think you get those guys a shot. You get a guy late in the fourth and fifth round, and let them all battle it out. If you take a guy in the second round, then you 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 tell him Mike Kaiser, you don't believe him. Yeah, and you're right with that Jordan Brooks guy because I know they were saying his that was his weakness is not being able to make those calls. He's comfortable in the box. So if you're gonna look at an outside ranger guy, it's another UVA guy that's Snowden, that Charles Snowden, who's who's real tall. You know what I mean? You can move around the field a little bit. You can stand him up, edge rusher, but being that outside linebacker, or I know they talked about that Malik Harrison from Ohio State, he's bounced around a little bit, and and because of um, what's his name, Shane, the number that the, the, the everyone's assuming is going to go to Washington. I mean, he was beating him to the punch half the time, but he was around the ball. So I think he's a, I think he's a sleeper. Um, yeah, actually, he, yeah, he tested good. Uh, he's six two two fifty. He ran a four six. He played good football in the Big Ten. He's going to be that downhill thumper. I think he fits in good in uh, later rounds in, in a fourth round pick, or uh, maybe maybe you reach in the third round and maybe grab him. But I think he's a solid, a solid fourth rounder, and, and he fits in the same mold as Kenny Young and and, and Mike Kaiser, that six two, two hundred forty, forty five pound guy that's in a four six range, four five. So uh, I think all those guys would be great, and 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 he can come in and battle it out with those guys. Now you mentioned Mike Kaiser. Yeah, I just have to wonder because he barely played his first year. He missed all of last season. So you sound like you're counting on him a lot. 
he's a third year guy, but he's been out so much. How are you so confident that he can step in and be ready next year? I'm not saying he's he's going to be ready, but he plays special teams. He's a wahoo. He so he got he got to be smart, right? Um, they still got him around. I mean, they could they could have let him go. They was expecting big things from him last year until he hurt his pet. Yeah, he put up big numbers in college, right? And he's a down here thumper. So I mean, he he fits all the attributes. Uh, at least you get you got to give him a shot to see what happened to him. Uh, the guy Reader they put in there last year. I don't think he was a good. Fit, uh, it was a little the, the talent or the, the 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 level was a little bit above his head. Got to get Mike Kaza, and I'm I'm a little biased because he is from Baltimore a little bit. <laughs> there you go. Now, at least he admits it. <laughs> but hey, you got to give him a shot. He made a lot of plays in college, right? Right, coach. Yeah, yeah. No, he, he's definitely a player. But you know how it goes. You know, clearly, if if I mean, and it's just the mock drafts because I, I kept seeing them trying to take a linebacker with that pick, and it was more of an inside guy. But, you know, depth never hurt nobody. And, and, and to push, push Michael Cosgrove, because who's going to push exactly. him? You exactly. know what I mean? But I see what you're saying to kind of maybe, if, you, if you're going to waste a pick that early and the writing is kind of on the wall because you're not going to use your second, one of your second picks or even third round for that guy to be on the sideline. Yeah, he coming in. He coming to start. I mean, he, he, he got to play. I mean, it took me five yeah. games to take – Get Mark Fields out of there. So, <laughs> I mean, they do yeah. that. You know, if you're an early pick, they're going to give you a shot. Fourth and fifth round, now he got to work and they can battle it out and he won't fail. Um, well, they're going to come in and get my spot. If you get a guy in the fourth or fifth round, now everybody feel like they're on an equal plane and we can battle this thing out. But I, I still like Michael Kaiser to win any battle. I don't care who you bring in there. Second, third, like, you're not going to. Underestimate that what that veteran does for the uh, the team. That voice that somebody had heard before, even though he might not have played in a lot of games, he still has done it at some point, either in preseason or a couple games that he has played in. For the record, though, Malik Harrison is a third round draft prospect. According to NFL.com, their their profile fits to probably be a starter within his first couple years. That's what the that's what the uh, report says on him. It sounds about right from what I've seen him play in Big Ten. Exactly. So, I mean, a stiff, a stiff. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, he'll, he'll be all right. So, big 10 linebacker. <laughs> hey, you know, I'm a Buckeye. What can I say? So, big slow 10. <laughs> not anymore. Come on now. You guys have been seeing some Buckeye games <laughs> last year. It's still slow 10. It's still the rest of the conference, not this conference. So, come on now. I mean, not this team. Come on. The, um, <laughs> yeah, they, now, yeah, Ohio State, they got some fast guys. I mean, they, they, they uh, always did. The I don't want to rethink that playoff game, but man, they definitely gave Clemson some problems. So I'm looking ahead here to the draft, but I also want to look back and, and talk to you both about your experiences in the draft process. And you have different ones, obviously. You, you both have been there and done that. You've worn the t-shirt in the NFL, but you took different roads. And you've been through all the pokes and prods that go with the draft process. So I wanted to ask you guys, as we're getting ready for this big show this week, what was your draft experience like? What was your, in terms of leading up to it and the good things and, and of course, the sad moments and, and what you had to go through overall as you prepared to enter the NFL? I'm going to start with you, Arlen. I know, I know your story is a little bit different than Tommy's. What was it like for you? Yeah, mine was like, you know, mine was kind of melodramatic to, in the sense of, you know, when I transferred out of UVA, you know, they brought an NFL coach, Al Groh, that came in there, you know, and said, hey, I know you're a starter, but you got four weeks. I'm giving you four weeks that I'm bringing my guys in. You know what I mean? You're coming in pre-ACC, and the writing was on the wall, you know, and he, and he held to that. I literally started for four games, and I went from being the guy to not even number two. Like I was getting scout team work, which was from that was humbling and that was new for me. And, you know, that was kind of a transition year from George Welsh to Al Grow, who's, you know, a uh, you know, Bill Parcells, NFL, this is my way, you know what I mean? And that was very hard for me. So when I transitioned out and transferred to Hofstra University, I knew they were gonna be in contention and it was a step down D one double A and be able to play against Montana and I was literally working out with Jess guy. 
you know what I mean? And, and being able to, you know, to try to get my feet wet with aspiration, aspirations to play at the next level and possibly get drafted still. But again, without getting into it, you know, there was confliction there where you know, they went out of the way. I missed my whole year. So, you know, when I left, I, I'm out of football for a year and a half. And, um, you know, only by the grace of God, I don't know how, but I was invited to a senior bowl that was called the Paradise Bowl at the time. Tony Romo was my quarterback. I don't know if you guys remember um, Cadillac from uh, – I mean, uh, not Cadillac. I'm sorry. Um, I forget the running back from uh, Nebraska. Just slipped my mind. But, I mean, there was big-name guys in that. It wasn't the Senior Bowl. It wasn't the – they didn't have the NFLPA Bowl at that time. But it was still a Senior Bowl. And that was my only – that was my only game of the year. End up winning MVP of that game. You know, Tony Romo threw me the winning touch, you know. So that kind of put me back on the map in a sense. I wasn't invited to the combine, um, obviously, but I tore up our pro day. And then literally using, like, we used the Jets facilities. So when the Jets came in and gave me a private workout, then, you know, the Texans and some other people started. It, it was a, kind of like a, a gem. It's funny. Um, shout out to Bucky, who still does analysis. He did an article on me, and I ran sub 4-4s. Four and, I mean, I'm a weight room guy. Like, I killed the pro day. And um, there was whispers of possibly getting drafted six, seventh round. And Wilbur Montgomery came out to the house and worked me out. He followed me. So to fast forward to draft day, I was just more so like, you know what? I'm going a, I'm to a be a priority free agent. And um, even before that, it was whispers of, TP, what's the draft before the draft? You know how there's a, there's a, there's a draft before the draft? It's like a small one. Uh are you talking about the supplemental draft that takes place afterwards? Yeah. Oh, the supplemental. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Like so, boy, that, that used to take during that time. It was before the draft, so they only take and it's only open up to because you know at that time there's still NFL Europe. So there's whispers of that, man. So I was kind of like, look, I just want my shot. And you know, the Eagles, the Redskins was talking to me about possibly bringing me in. So fast forward to combine. I mean, draft day for me. I sat, watched it, and believe it or not, my phone rang as early as the fifth round, you know what I mean? The Eagles and, you know, I knew Westbrook. I trained with uh, Brian Westbrook, you know, Villanova guy. And, um, you know, he was talking to me like, yo, man, you'll be a good fit, similar bill. You know, he was kind of on a transition. So, you know, I was like, man, I might be staying home. But <laughs> that phone never rung again. Then, you know, two other teams called, said the same thing. Hey, you know, we got two picks in the sixth round. If you're going to be our second pick, stay by the phone. Phone never rang. Then the Rams called me, and that year they actually had three seventh-round picks. And they took two tight ends and a kicker. <laughs> and I say, yo, man, this is – I say, I, I get it. I didn't play, but no offense, but a kicker. Like, you can't scoop me up on the last pick. So – um, you know, I, and then once once the draft's over, so people understand now when you're a priority free agent, people still come in and offers. Now you're kind of in a driver's seat where some people say it's almost better in that time, maybe fix fifth, six, seven round where you can actually select your own team. And people thought I was crazy coming to St. Louis with Marshall here. But no offense, I looked, I saw they had Lamar Gordon and all that. And I'm like, after 2-8, like that's <laughs> – Two eights, the guy, you know what I mean? I feel like I can come in here. They had Leon Washington, who we had the same agent. And Leon Washington, he was what he was. I think he got a nice little sign-up bonus. And I beat both of those guys out as a rookie, you know what I mean? And I think also being a returner and, again, coming from UVA, smart guy, I absorbed the, the, the playbook pretty quickly. And I knew my, I knew my role, man, and, and pretty much – the rest was the rest was here history, and it was a blessing, and you know what I mean. And, and 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 here we are. And that year, they had nine. The Rams had nine picks, draft picks. They brought in five um, priority free agents, and then they brought in Leon Wash. They had like three free. Uh, they went and got. Um, I'm sorry, excuse me. Guys off of waivers, and I turn around and I look like yo. How did I? I was one of the last man standing. Only five of us played between Pisa, Sean McDonald, myself, all those guys they picked before me, those two tight ends, the kicker, all them guys was gone. So in hindsight, it's like, hey, I would have loved to be able to walk around and say, man, I was drafted no matter what the pick is. But those guys that were drafted, 
they they was home. You know, so it all it all it all worked out at the end, man. So that's kind of my my draft situation, how it went down, and um it's 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 unique in, I guess in its own little way. Tommy, with your draft, second rounder on the gray show on turf teams, what was your experience like? It was all conventional basically. Um I went to Florida State, that's why I went to Florida State, you know, to put myself in position to be a high draft pick. I knew if I put it down on the field played in enough big games, I would be in that position. So every year what I would do, when the pros came for pro day, I always was out there watching the guys run up and pass. So when it was my time, everything I can, and, he's, and also talking to those guys who got drafted before me. You know, yeah, Sam Kyle, I mean, the list goes on. The, I used to ask those guys from freshman year all about, you know, the draft and, what, and what's going to happen. So for me, it was just uh, – a normal, natural thing that I, I put in the work, and it's supposed to happen. Maybe because I went to Florida State, and I, like I said, I had all all those experiences and all those guys. But the things I remember was going to the Senior Bowl and not really wanting to go because I felt like I, I did enough. But I went to play well there and and did, did all that the Senior Bowl stuff. And, and it was, but like I said, everything was expected. You know, I was expecting to do well and and meet all these people and, and do all that. So go to Senior Bowl and. Then I go to train down IMG. Now I'm down IMG training. You know, you go to IMG train for the draft, and um, and they got LT, uh, that's the Danny Thomas, and Drew Brees, uh, Freddie Mitchell. Um, we had uh, um, uh, Steve Hutchison, um, uh, Tate Cody, uh, guy I played with at Florida State, Chris Winky. So we had a lot of guys and a couple of Hall of Famers in there. Um, just to get back on it. So just preparing that IMG, getting up every morning, knowing that you're preparing for this this big event, the combine or your pro day. Um, so going through all that, I mean, it, it, was, it was great. It was everything that I heard and everything that I expected. So just training with those guys and realizing, man, these guys, <laughs> these guys are great. And, and come from Florida State, it was, it was, it was a big surprise because you think at Florida State we got all the best talent. I'm going against L. LT and he making me work. And I'm like, man, man, this is going to be this is a little tougher than I thought. So, but working with him every day only got me better, it got me ready for the league and, and and things like that. But then going to the combine, um, I tore my ACL my junior year, so going through all the poking and prodding, I had to sit down with all the teams and they everybody poke, I mean, pulling at the knee. One doctor say, oh, it's good. Then the next doctor come in for another team, bam, and do the same. Do the same thing, same process, and he'll leave out. And then another doctor. So doing that 25, 30 times gets old. Um, being up all day, uh, you got to get up early in the morning, meet with teams, um, and, and you got to do your way in. And it's like a cattle herd walking in there, and your shirt is off, and hundreds of people sitting in there looking at you. So I, I did my blood pressure test. Uh, well, high, you know, they do your, all your blood pressure, mm-hmm. high blood pressure. So they're like, man, Tom, you got a high blood pressure. And I'm like, I know, man, all this stuff that's going on here, all this uh, questions y'all asking me and all that, I mean, yeah, your pressure, your pressure should be high. Um, so then you got to go out and bench perform. You got to bench press run the 40 and, and everybody watching you and things like that. I feel kind of, you know, sorry for these guys that got to do it in front of the cameras. At least when we did it, it wasn't a lot of guys, you know, it wasn't a lot of cameras around. It was kind of a lockdown. But the thing I do remember at the combine was Tad Ochocinco. So, and that's Chad Johnson. So he's saying, uh, so we, he's walking around the combine. I'm about to shock the world. I'm about to shock the world. What you going to shock the world? I'm going to run a 4-2. So he goes out there. He got these yellow tights on. i never forget. He got these yellow tights on. He's walking through the combine saying he's, how he's going to shock the world. So he runs his 40. And this on record, he runs a 4-6. Oh, man, everybody was clowning. and talking about, man, you didn't shock the world all right. I mean, he had his yellow tights on and all, and everything, but he wound up being a great player in the end. But it was just crazy for him to how he was back then. Nobody was doing that at that time, being flamboyant and, and things of that nature. Everything was all business, but he kind of kept it light. So then after that, you know, you had you played a waiting game, and you, I didn't meet, I didn't go travel to meet with a lot of teams, but I remember meeting with the Rams at the combine though, and um, they gave me a little test, some little test with you. Your, your little hand or whatever it was, and 
Mike said I did good on the test, whatever the case. I never understood. It was with his psychologist, whatever the case. I, I don't know, whatever. So I met with him at the combine. He said it went good. Um, then I, I go home to Baltimore, and I, I mean, I went for draft day. Um, but, but like I said, everybody, I think, from my youth already kind of figured I was going to be in that position. So it wasn't a, like, a, wow, he's here. It was like, okay, <laughs> this was the work he did, and this did. This would expect it. So I'm sitting in my house on draft day in East Baltimore with the whole neighborhood sitting around. And first round go by, and I'm pissed. Oh, man, I'm pissed. Because I had two teams telling me they were going to take me in the second round. I mean, the first round, leading the first round. I had the, the Dolphins tell me. And then, like Arlen said, um, he had guys, you know, people telling you they're going to take you. But every pick that went by after 20, I'm I got my little drink on the side of the bed. I'm taking my shot. <laughs> Just to be honest with you. <laughs> and, and um, so I'm doing that. So Deuce McAllister goes to the Saints. I thought I was going to the Saints. And then uh, another DB goes to the Dolphins. I thought I was going there. So the Rams call. And I, I was kind of mad already. Like I said, in my feelings, I thought I should have went first round. But you know, you know, after I got on, after I talked to him, and and the dust settled, and I, you know, everybody was happy, and things like that. Um, it you know, it, it was cool, but it was everything. It was it was it was everything that you heard about. It was frustrating. It was aggravating. It was um, it was joyous because you know what's about what you about to come into, and um, you know, your mom and your family was happy, but it was stressful, man. It was it's stressful now just thinking about. <laughs> In the end, though. It seems like both of you grew from the experience one way or the other. Like you became better for it. Arlen by going through the process and, and not hearing your name called, but picking your team, getting to play with that team for a while and going through the life experience you had. And then Tommy being drafted, going through the whole process and, and learning how it all works out. So, Am I right? Am I wrong there? Did you do you feel like you grew through that process? Yeah, you feel like you grew because you can't control it. You know, there's it's nothing you can do but just sit there and pray to God somebody call your name. You just want <laughs> one. You just, you just want somebody call your name. Just one person, and and that's it. And they said that's all it takes is uh, one person to call, uh, one team to call your name. And but it, man, it, it took. I think six to seven hours for that for that process to happen. I know Arlen. I know I'm sitting here um, talking, you know, talking spilt milk, whatever the case. And Arlen had to sit there, you know, two days, three days, you know, whatever how long that process was. And I had to sit there. I'm complaining about six hours, but to me, it felt like the same process. Um, I think all I had invested that was behind me, all the people that was expecting me to be there, it was like that's what this is. This is the moment, and um. And I want to make everybody proud. So when you got all that on your back, and and, <laughs> and, it, and it don't happen, or it do happen, or it don't happen when you want. Yeah, I mean, it could be, it could be tough. We just got to hang in there. So, looking forward now, Arlen, how did you grow from the whole process? I would say mentally, and just really seeing the business side, because again, you're young. You come out and you're maybe naive to that part of it. I know when I was growing up, I just more so, I collected baseball cards. Like My thing was like, yo, my dream was I just want to be able to have a baseball card. Like That was success to me. That was a rival, like getting into the NFL. So hindsight, I never really had. Like, I'm going to be a first-round pick. I want to play for this team. I didn't have. My older brother did. So even seeing my brother go through that process, I mean, he came through Penn State. He was projected first, second round. He was the guy. You know what I'm saying? And when he tore his knee up his last year, right, going into the senior bowl, he wasn't able to play. I got to see all that process. And so when it was my turn, I felt like I kind of, when I didn't have that opportunity, like Tommy said, you got family members. It was kind of like, ah, man, I let them down or it wasn't really expected for me to be in that position because my brother was already doing it. You know what I mean? Like, he was getting hot. Like, he was the guy. So, in hindsight, for it still to work out and me come through the back window, per se, 
it's just humbling. And I, this is what I share to the youth, to the kids. Like I always tell them, I always say, I say, yo man, what's for you is for you. Like right now through the recruiting process, some of these guys looking at college, you can't dictate what some of these offers somebody else is getting. And you're like, man, he's trash or why I'm being slept on and all that stuff. You got to be ready. And I feel like the reason why Mike Martz, in essence, I was kind of like his guy to where I felt like he know what he was going to get out of me. When they called me, run out there and punt, I did my job. He knew he could move me around whether I was returning the kick. or I remember one time he threw me on the front line. He moved me, threw somebody back there, and be like, man, put all in the front. He'll block it. I'm like, whoa, man, this is <laughs> that's two different worlds. Like, I went from returning the ball to me, mm-hmm. one of the hardest things to do on a football field. I got to run on the front line. So I wear that. I, I mean, I just – I'm not one of those guys that – Again, everybody wants to be the guy now because, I, like I said, my third, fourth year, I started getting to the point where I'm like, I don't want to be, you know, you start sliding back in the line. Like, I don't want to be just known as a teamer. So I feel like when you say as far as growing, I think the mental aspect and being able to t- talk to the younger guys and then be even a better coach because everyone thinks, you know, we might be Neanderthals running around and just colliding into each other. It's still a mental game. You still got to, understand the preparation, the passion, and each level from high school, college, and pros, they got to know there's money behind this. And and the sooner you you understand that, what, what have you done for me lately, and maybe the business aspect, I think the further you can go through that transition from into real life. Because, you, you know, you've heard the stories, a lot of not just football, but professional players, when they transition, they really struggle with that. So I felt like, Man, I've seen the highs and lows at every level. So that transition for me was maybe a little bit easier than a guy, like you said, like a TP, like you knew, like it's no shock. Like I'm the guy, like I put in work, I work for this, I'm used to this. And when I'm, and, and then maybe that transition is like, okay, you know, how, how do we, how do we go, how do we go from here? So that's a long way for me to say, I, I think how I, I, I grew as a person from the experience and, Nobody can take that from me. You know, I can say I'm vested. I, I got a home. I'm mad. Matter of fact, I don't know if you remember Eric Flowers, mm-hmm. TP, when he was at Ram, sure. like, you talking about a first round pick and you don't make the team. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I look at things like that's how I, I absorb that, where you, you know, where you might want to say, man, I'm not getting my due. When am I going to get my opportunity? Sometimes I'm like, I'd rather maybe crawl through this mud and begin and then be the guy and then I'm home. You know what I mean? I could imagine being a first round pick and not make the team. I, I like that's that's, that's how I mean, that's that's like I don't know. And I, I remember uh remember I w- I was close with uh geez, your, your your boy from uh Penn State when they picked up Jimmy. Like oh, he Jimmy struck. Kennedy. Yeah, Jimmy when he came here, man, he a Penn State dude, East Coast cat. He came in, he was our first round pick. And Mike, like, he, he didn't have an easy time. They weren't really on him like that. But because he's a first-round pick, you know, he going to get a multiple. He, first, you got to save face. He going to get a lot of opportunities. But I, I just learned from that. Like, okay, these, just because you might have got that that nod early, it don't, just, it don't mean that that's going to be there forever. All right. So a little bit of fun here to end this episode, okay? We've been seeing, there's, I'm totally shifting gears here, by the way. We've been seeing all these new uniforms coming out this last week. The Patriots came out today. We've seen the new Buccaneers uniforms. I don't know if you guys have seen those, right? The new Rams uniform waiting on and, and expecting it to be horrid. And then the, you know, I mean, that's just how it's been. The Browns released theirs, going back to pretty much what it used to be. I just want to ask you guys. You guys have seen a lot of football, and I want to ask you flat out. What are your three worst uniform changes in the last 25 years? Where would you rank them? Oh, man, I'm going to go with the Bucks in the 80s. Um, that was that was kind of terrible with the popping on the side, the like cream color one, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, you don't like the um, orange cream sickle? Nah, I don't know about <laughs> that. <laughs> I, I don't like those. Uh, I'm gonna also go with the Steelers throwbacks. I, I never liked those. Ooh, yeah. Uh, those. The, do you know which ones? The, the yeah, the, I know what you're talking. about. They look like in jail. Look like the bars on there. Yeah, yeah. man, they are terrible. 
And what's another one? Let me see. I'm going to go. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with um. I'm gonna go with New England Patriots in, in the '80s when they had like the Patriot guy on the front when they lost in the Super Bowl. The um, <laughs> really? Yeah. You didn't like yeah, that, that one? No, I don't like that. But then all of the University of Maryland Terps uniforms are terrible. So <laughs> <laughs> that's just one of the script. All of them. All of them. I mean, every last one of them. But. That's my three. Wow. I, I mean, the Patriots one is actually, they wear that now sometimes as a throwback, and it, I kind of like it. It's a little, little bit, and there is demand now for the Orange Cream Skulls to come back, so here you say that one, and I, I find that interesting. Arlen, your three worst uniform changes in the last 25 years. I'm going to go with first. I'm a Philly boy. When, when they go with the, the like baby blue, yellow, Throwbacks. Remember when Donovan McNabb put the? Do uh, you guys remember those? When they, they, they it's home. like, huh? They don't pull them like one time. They look yeah. like the Denver Nuggets. Yeah, Denver Nuggets yeah. Uniform. <laughs> yeah. When when they came out with that, I'm like, man, Philly. I, you got to think green. So when that that whole color changed to me, <laughs> and then they had almost like it, it looked like Delaware. Because you're yeah, running yeah. like almost yeah, like them Delaware helmets. I I and the blue hens. I wasn't yeah. that. That always stuck to me when I first saw it. I wasn't a fan of those. And then um, I think the Bears, when they have that, uh, what's that, like that circle, I don't know what year, we, that the big old circle in the chest with the, um, well, with like the numbers, the just circle. the white numbers. Oh, you like I it? I like the circle circle. Uh, I like the circle. No, I'm, I'm not. A, those to me, they're like they just found that in like a, a, a Cracker Jack <laughs> box or something like that. I'm not, I'm not a fan. And then. Again, you'll notice, and there's another baby blue. I'm just not a fan of wearing baby blue for some reason, like with football. But those, uh, the Oilers, where they have the little, when they almost had the little Oiler thing mm-hmm. on the. Yeah. I mean, they known for that, you know, with the white helmets. I, I'm just never was a fan of when they put that much, like red, baby blue, and white. Don't really. Give us nice drawings, though. You can nice do it, nice drawings with them, though. What? <laughs> yeah, drawings or, or the S or the SMU. <laughs> Back in the Pony Express, but those those for me were the, were the three that hopped, uh, really stuck out to me. I wasn't really a fan though. So, uh, guys, I, I got to throw mine in here too. And, and one's cheating a little bit because I asked for 25 years and I'm, I'm going back to that 1994 season, the 75th anniversary, when the Cowboys wore that one with the star on the shoulder. I hated that freaking jersey. I hated it. <laughs> I, I, hate I, the Cowboys anyway. I, I, I don't like, yeah, I don't like the Cowboys anyway, but. I hated that jersey. The and this is nothing against St. Louis, but I hate when the Rams change those colors to the royal blue and the gold. I mean, it just I always knew the Rams is the royal blue and the the yellow that they're going back to now. They call it soul, whatever. But <laughs> that mean I know the golden and the navy blue look probably more fashionable. Compare you not many people out there wearing yellow and royal blue out in public and wanting to, but it didn't look right to me. And then the the Browns one when the Browns changes over to this last one, it looked ridiculous. With the Browns number on the right. front of it and the weird brown with it, just the Browns just look clean with these the Browns uniforms. I mean, they, yeah, that they went back to that, right? They did. They did. Yeah, I, I had to throw a fourth one in because it's it's like a tie for third. Those last versions of the, of the Bucks uniforms were horrid too. The uh, yeah, I don't like them either. Ugh. Yeah, they changed. Bucks the can't, just can't seem to get it right. The best, well, the best ones they have is one Brooks and the Mark. That's they went back to something similar to that though. Right, it, it is similar. It is so, similar with the with the pants side, but but Derek, you can't just just skip over. I, I mean, you let t- TP got drafted in those colors, and you just pretty much said that he didn't look good. That's not I don't like the <laughs> I, I, I was fools. You understand? I grew up Eric Dickinson and them Charles White. Are you gonna send me out here with this? Nah, man. <laughs> I mean, that, that's that jersey was the like, iconic one, and, and especially the way the horn looked on there. And that's that's really why the fans are throwing a fit. It's like you, they were worried they're gonna lose. They're gonna mess with the colors. They got the colors right, and then they. They make a, a logo that looks like a Chargers bolt. 
then that helmet, that horn is iconic. So that's why I keep saying the expectation is they're, they're going to suck. I hope, I hope I'm wrong, by the way. But I don't know if you guys saw the prototype, that one that was uh, quote-unquote leaked last week. I don't know if you guys saw it. Yeah, I, I, the yeah their, their best bet, man, is to go almost with that. It's going to have to, it's going to end up looking like a color rush uniform. Kind of how, like they said, the Patriots copied off of their color rush. Because, mm -hmm. I mean, these so called new uniforms, I mean, I haven't seen from the Falcons to the, they all look browns. They, they look decent, but I'm with you. If they mess with those horns, man, it's going to be, that's going to be a problem. The, um, the helmet that was leaked, and, and the one I want to stress, the leak, and it was right the first time. Who knows it was right the second time? The horn breaks off like the logo does on the. Um, mm. Oh man! And I know it seems so minor, like it's just a, but it doesn't curl around and breaks through. That people are gonna freak, man. Yeah, that, I agree. That's that's. I know it's the XFL. There's a, a helmet. Look, I should have. Again, we can't. We're on. We're on a microphone. We can't show, but I, it. I fits up. It's a Canadian team. Um, not the barn, the storm troop, but it's, it's, it's something similar to that. And I was like, man, I just don't think it's going to look professional, man. It's going to look too, too like artsy. <laughs> you know what I mean? If they mess with those horns on that helmet. Well, let me ask you guys this question. Since we're talking uniform changes here. If there was, I'm, I'm not saying, and this is no disrespect towards any other team that any team you guys played for, but there was, if there was one uniform you could have worn in the NFL, solely because it was just a bad bleep and bleep and uniform, like awesome uniform, what uniform would it have been for you? Man, Detroit Lions Thanksgiving game. I kept mine. I that black, I know that that I'm telling you what, that I didn't know that you in Jersey, you think man, you in the NFL, but it was a difference. The quality jersey that the Detroit Lions, when I played over there, the, all the colors, but, and man, if I could wear that black, that Thanksgiving, I mean, we was riled up about that, and that's the only time they, they go in that black. That was that was legit. That, that was my favorite uniform, I think. So if I'm asking you to pick any jersey, you, you pick one that you wish that you, for a team you play for. Well, that's I thought that's the question. So you're talking about any in general? Any in general. You so if, if you if this, if you could have worn any jersey, any uniform in your career, what would it have been? I'm gonna let TP go because I ooh that's this any of them, thirty two of them. Give me they can give me <laughs> they can give them to me again. I really I really didn't. I mean, when I was coming out, I, I, you know, I liked the Redskins a little because I was, you know, that was my team in the area. John Riggins and all those guys, Dell Green on the defense, um, that was my team in the in the area. But uh, I just wanted to make it to the professional league, make my mom proud. That's it. So it didn't matter what jersey. It didn't. It could have been anybody jersey. So I would say just for my favorite team, yeah, the Redskins. It was the hometown team, of, you know, at the time because we didn't have the Ravens or the Col Colts that left in the eighties. Um, so, yeah, probably the Redskins. That's it. Draft is coming up this Thursday. Any closing thoughts for you guys as we get out of here? Man, I, I, it, at first, I think it's going to be interesting. Watch online. I know they, they did their little mock draft and had a hiccup early. Um, I know the excitement is going to be hard to be felt because of, you know, where we are right now. But I'm going to be tuned in. Hopefully, uh, it's, it's a good draft for 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 LA, and we we you know get back on course. But um, I'm just interested in seeing how they're going to still make it interesting. I know with the booze, you know, you see how like Budweiser is trying to do a little thing with the booze and try to make the fans more excited. I don't know if they'll be able to recover that excitement. That's what I'm looking forward to. Is just kind of see these young men get their name called. You know, I got my nephew. He's going to be. You know, hopefully he hears name called first day. So it's going to be interesting to see how that that all pans out. You want to shout him out? Yazir Durant, starting left tackle for four years from Mizzou, Philly boy. But uh, you know he he's he'll have an opportunity. But um, you know it sucks that this is going to be his experience. He's you know he's he, he's at home. You know he, he'll be at home and and um, even after the selection and some of those high guys, but they will fly right out and all that stuff. It's you know, right now, I know the NFL is doing their, what's their virtual 
online programming right now. So it's going to be interesting, man. This is this. Hopefully, this is the last time we'll have to go through something like that. But I think it's just going to be par for the course for for what's going to happen. Tommy, think was that? Yeah, I like you know, I'm same thing with all, you know. Um, just looking forward to uh, a lot of families' lives getting changed. Um, I know every time I see a guy uh, talk about his situation, it makes me get queasy inside. So going through that a whole bunch of times is like, you know, that's why I like it. Um, I know these guys, they put in a lot of hard work, a lot of sacrifice, a lot of dedication, and they get to this point right here, and it's, it's life change. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, I'm also looking forward to how this whole process going to work out. Um, like I honestly said, they did the virtual draft today, and they didn't get off to a, such a great start. I think they got the first first pick. They couldn't get the first pick in. So hopefully they'll work all the kinks out and, and, and get this process uh, process going. So it's going to be interesting to see if the Internet don't crash. Um, my wife is trying to watch something, look at something on Instagram today, and she couldn't, she couldn't. She couldn't. She couldn't catch it. It was too much traffic. Um, so hopefully it's not too much traffic, and and people can really get a, a different um, view uh, of the draft and see these guys' lives transform right in front of our eyes. And it's, it's a great thing to see. All right, so folks, next time you talk to us, we'll have a different thing going on here called the draft breakdown. And uh, in the meantime, go check us out on Twitter at Rams Brawl and Facebook as well, Instagram. Find me on Twitter, DC Polly. Find Tommy at Tommy at T, Tommy Polly at T Polly twenty nine, and Arlen Harris at Arlen Harris thirty three. Look for us wherever you can find podcasts, and we'll be there. And we'll see you next week. We're out of here.